Hi everybody, my name is Lindsay Sabadosa and I am the state representative in the 1st Hampshire District. I'm coming to you today with my monthly update about what's going on in the State House. And this month we decided to do something a little bit different. We want to talk about a particular piece of legislation that I filed, which is an act establishing Medicare for All in Massachusetts. Now I filed that piece of legislation in the House and Senator Jamie Eldridge filed it in the Senate. It's a really huge piece of legislation that's going to take a lot of organizing and that can sometimes be a little bit confusing for people. So today I've invited two people into my office to have a conversation about Medicare for All, what it is, what it means, what it will look like for the state of Massachusetts. So I'd like to welcome Deborah Levinson, who is the co-convener of the Western Mass Medicare for All, and Devin Grayson, who is an assistant professor of health communication at UMass Amherst. Did I get everything right? <laughs> yes, thanks. Okay, good. Um, so I just really wanted to have a pretty informal conversation today so that everybody at home has a better idea of what this legislation is, because I think you both know we get a lot of questions about it all of the time, um, and it's in the media all the time, so people are really starting to pay attention, and I'd like to make sure that we're doing some education in First Hampshire. So let's just start off and talk about what is Medicare for All. So thank you, Lindsay, very much. It's nice to be here. Um, so. Medicare for All, or single payer, is a way of paying for health care. It is not the delivery of health care. We're not suggesting that the way we receive our health care change, only how we pay for it. So um, our current system involves a whole array of payers. Yes. We have public payers like Medicare and Medicaid or MassHealth in Massachusetts, as well as many private insurers. And all of those insurers bill differently, code differently, have different policies, have different kinds of coverage that change all the time. It's a very complicated, difficult system to navigate, and it's expensive. And a lot of times that goes through an employer as well, right? That's right. Yes. And the, the majority of people actually receive their benefits through an employer, and then the employer has to deal with all of the complexity of that system and purchasing that and deciding and uh, administering. And at a really enormous cost a lot of times, too. Exactly. And overall, the whole system runs at about a 30% overhead, meaning that 30 cents on every one of our health care dollars goes to overhead administration and profit for private insurers. It's a lot of money. It's real high. And Medicare itself runs at about 4% wow. overhead. So it's much more efficient. That's right. It's more efficient. It's less costly. And we can we can, our, our health care dollars would have a lot more value. They would buy more health care rather than buying the bureaucracy of the insurance industry. But Medicare for All isn't really just expanding Medicare, because we're talking about a bill on the right. state yeah. level, and I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes in. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, it's a, that's a really important, important distinction. So, of course, Medicare is a federal program. Right. Um, and as you say, we don't have that in the state, but we use the term Medicare for, for All because it's familiar yes. to people. People turn 65, they're on Medicare. Most of us are very happy when that happens. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's kind of to reassure people, this, this is a similar kind of program. In fact, it's an improved and expanded program. The current Medicare has um, is is becoming actually more expensive. There's there's copays, there are deductibles. People need to buy in most cases a private supplemental policy. And then there's the donut too, which we hear a lot about <laughs> in my office. Yes, yeah, so on on uh, for drugs right. for paying for yes. for ph pharmaceuticals. So the proposed Medicare for all or single payer system would cover all those gaps so that seniors on Medicare would find a great improvement in their own coverage, too. That's great. And um, Devin, one of the things that was really interesting to me, I heard you speak, I think about a week ago now, about your experiences having lived um, both in Canada and the United States and experiencing both of those healthcare systems. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was a, a really great thing for people at home to listen to, to what that could be like and what you found. So would you mind sharing a little bit about that? Sure. And in fact, when I left the United States and went to Canada to pursue graduate education mm -hmm. there, uh, my job 
uh, in Michigan at the time was I was the director of a small nonprofit, and I felt that squeeze that Deborah's describing, yeah. trying every year to find and negotiate and um, obtain insurance coverage for a small employee pool in a small business of people who have all sorts of different needs, and um, it took so much time and stress yeah. and money from our small organization's budget every year to try to provide decent coverage for our employees, and every year their deductibles went up and fewer things were covered. Um, yeah. So I, I know that pinch that you're talking about as a, you know, a small employer. Right. It is very real, and removing that burden from the employer would be um, you know, phenomenal for small businesses um, of all sorts. But then when I moved to Canada, mm -hmm. uh, I was a student, and um, actually right after I moved there, uh, not long afterwards, I became quite ill for a little while. And um, new country, new system, it's, it was... Um, stressful time. And were you able to obtain coverage quickly when you got Yes, there? so the province I moved into has a three-month waiting period. Okay. So um, the university I went to said, said to all the incoming international students, mm -hmm. go buy this temporary policy, a gap policy. Was that really expensive? For my whole family, which is three people, it was around $189 Canadian for oh. all three months. <laughs> That's not very expensive. No, it was delightful. It <laughs> yes. was far less than I was paying in monthly yeah. deductibles and copays and things. Yeah back in the States, yes. So um, I, we, but it wasn't until the, um, our provincial Medicare mm -hmm. kicked in and covered me that I became ill and had to seek care for that. And the care I got was great. It was a challenging problem to figure out. Um, so it took a while. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I will always be grateful that I moved to Canada at the time that I did because that stressful period of my life could have been so much more difficult and stressful yeah. for our family if there had been financial concerns involved. As it was, the costs that I had were a few prescription drug co-pays, mm -hmm. um, parking lots at hospitals, <laughs> that type of thing. Yeah. It was very minimal. That's funny. I, people don't usually bring that up as a health care expense, although it obviously, you know, parking in hospitals can certainly be. But I think when you talk to people here, we talk about co-pays and deductibles as really our major health care costs. So it's kind of amazing to hear your cost being so low that you've considered parking even you know as you're tallying up how much you spent to get care so mm -hmm. you work at UMass now so you've obviously moved back to the states yes. what was that experience like coming back and navigating the U.S. healthcare system well I thought um I I was pleased to be moving to Massachusetts mm -hmm. first of all because Massachusetts has such a great reputation for having a strong social safety net right. and Massachusetts was you know, a real leader in healthcare and a model for the Affordable Care Act, which has improved U.S. healthcare and, yeah. and conditions so immensely since I left. I mean, when I left, our state didn't require insurers to cover maternity care. Yes. <laughs> Things have changed incredibly since then. So I thought, well, it would be a soft landing mm -hmm. um, coming back. My employer insurance um, didn't start for three months, but I figured I'd been through that before, through right? That, it would be right. no problem. So Save I started. Save him a hundred, right? something yeah, and I was, Well, actually, I couldn't find anything. I was shopping around. I was looking online. I was calling um, travel insurance policies. I was looking on that the website mm -hmm. for um, the Massachusetts on Health the Connector, Connector yes. Yes, website, but I couldn't mm -hmm. find anything. Um, partly because I had no identity because I was coming from a different country, even though I have a social security number and things. Yeah. I, had, I had no identity in the system, and partly because um, there was just nothing I could buy until I was actually here. So we had to take a bit of a leap of faith and arrive here and then go wait in a queue at a hospital. And I now know the process is you go to a hospital... Um, you have to find out which hospital it is or where they have a navigator. You go before they open, you wait in a queue with everybody else who's uninsured, you get a number, and then in order of that number, you can pick up a phone and call somebody who gives you a time, and hopefully your time is before they finish for that day. So you can meet with somebody who can show you your options for purchasing health insurance. An incredible level of bureaucracy. It was, and I have to say, I mean, I literally have a PhD in health information. Wow. <laughs> Most people don't have that kind of privilege and experience navigating health systems and health information. Um, it's, I think it's too much to expect of 
people. And so one of the uh, questions that I get a lot about if we move towards Medicare for All in Massachusetts, which of course I'm very hopeful that we will do, is if health care is going to be rationed. Because you know people say, well, in other countries health care is rationed. Was that your experience in Canada? Or what? Can you speak to that at all? I don't know what direction you want to take the question. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> well, first of all, health care is certainly rationed here. Yes, that is. I would it's, agree. It's rationed by many different mm-hmm. players. It's rationed by insurance companies. It's rationed by who has coverage and who doesn't, um, and what level of coverage. So there's quite a bit of rationing going on mm-hmm. here, and it's kind of disingenuous if we don't acknowledge that to begin with. Great point. Um, second of all, uh, so in Canada, um, each province has its own sort of administration mm-hmm. of Medicare. So there are certain guarantees federally, mm-hmm. and then each province administers it differently. Oh, sort of the, each state here administers things slightly differently. Um, and, certain, and there are certain federal minimums. And um, those states do make decisions Mm -hmm. um, how much they will pay for certain things, um, what drugs they will cover, just like uh, your insurance company here decides what drugs they will cover or not. Uh, So there are decisions made. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say in a public system, there's a lot more transparency typically Mm -hmm. around the way those decisions are made. You know who's on the board making the decisions. You um, can sort of look into... Um, their background, and if they have conflicts of interest, there are often, you know, who the researchers who are advising them would be, um, and doing sort of the health technology assessment for those decisions. But in terms of rationing, can you see the provider of your choice, Mm -hmm. or is there a limit to the amount of visits you can have? There's there's nothing like that. Um, And in fact, um, and what about wait times? We hear about oh, wait times. Wait times. <laughs> well, first, I just have to say, when yes, I, I would come um, and visit for, you know, see my parents back in the States, and people would ask me, even, you know, I'd rent a car, and the rental car person would say, um, oh, you're coming from Canada. You know, I hear you can't choose your doctor there. Mm-hmm. I'd say, no, it's here that you can't choose your doctor. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> in Canada, everybody is in the same network. There's all one network. And so if the doctor is accepting new patients you can go and make them your doctor. Right. Um, and they're not going to get bumped out of network or stop accepting your insurance. You might have to leave if they retire. Of course. But uh, the choice is immensely uh, so much larger in a universal system where there aren't these little fiefdoms and networks um, competing with each other. There are wait times for non-emergency okay. um, procedures. Right. Um, I feel like that can happen here, though, too. I feel like well, if, you're, if you don't have an emergency, <laughs> then you don't always get in very quickly. But here, there are also waits for emergency procedures based yeah. on your insurance status. That is true. Whereas in a universal system where everyone is covered, if you present with an emergency, they will deal with it. Mm-hmm. There's no, we need to see your insurance first. There's no, um, you have bad insurance, so you need to go to this other clinic and get, and, you know, wait. Um, if it's an emergency, you are triaged in the level of urgency, mm-hmm. not by how much you can pay or how much your insurance can pay for things. So there are weights in both systems. It's a matter of values, really. Do we value providing care to the people who need it most mm-hmm. urgently and prioritizing procedures in that way? Right. And while it's not pleasant to wait for something that is not medically urgent, but mm-hmm. still medically necessary. Mm-hmm. You may be in pain yeah. for a while, and you know those wait times should get shorter. Right. Uh, Canada is working to address those, yeah. but do we want to prioritize wait times on how urgent a medical need is, or do we want to prioritize them based on how well someone can pay? And that's a question of values. It is indeed a question of values, and. I, you know, I very much agree with the values argument. And then I hear a lot of people talking about it from an economic standpoint. So, you know, we all agree that people should have coverage, but how are we possibly going to afford this? And is it, um, like, are, are we going to lay off a lot of people? What's going to happen to drug prices? So what is the expectation? Who is, who is going to pay for this <laughs> Medicare for all system? What's going to happen? Um, to, to premiums and to these copays and deductibles. Right. So all the research that has ever been done on single payer health care right. or Medicare for all mm-hmm. shows that it's a less expensive system overall than our current system. The real question is, how can we afford our current mm-hmm. system? And actually the answer is we're we're not affording it. <sighs> What's happening is more and more people are underinsured. 
they may have coverage but can't afford to actually get health care. So they're not accessing it. They're not accessing health care. Yes. That's right. They have insurance, but they don't have health care because of high deductibles, high premiums, high co-pays, and so on. I mean, I've certainly experienced that in, in my, with my prior health insurance. Our copay was so high that I absolutely made decisions, you know, for my child, I would bring her in the second she got sick, but for myself, you know, if it might just be the flu, then I did not go in. And that's I right. You may hear put, that from people. That's right. You, you make choices, and we don't always have the information we need to make great choices for our own health care. And so, and the more we delay the primary care and the timely care, conditions can become more serious and more chronic and more expensive, too. Um, so, so overall, costs go down. And the reason is because those administrative costs come way down. And in the longer term, the cost curve comes down, the increases come down, because with a single payer, they have the clout to negotiate prices. Right. So there's someone at the, on the other side of the negotiating table with the pharmaceutical companies, with the medical device companies, with the big hospitals, who has the power to, to negotiate more reasonable costs. Mm -hmm. there, there's, there's nothing now that really is restraining these skyrocketing costs, and it's why we have these incredible, un unaffordable situation. And interestingly, uh, this doesn't seem to be a bipartisan issue, the, the discussion about exorbitant costs, and particularly around prescription drug costs, because we're hearing both sides of the aisle right now saying that we really need to do something about this. Yeah. Although we might not hear both sides using the term Medicare for all, it's interesting that we are all acknowledging that the current system is broken. So right. I've heard a statistic, and, and you can certainly, please correct me if I'm wrong, that the average person spends about 18% of their income on health care. And well, that's the national figure. The national to eighteen percent of GNP wow. is—is um, is that right? GNP as on um, on healthcare spending, which is twice, about twice, uh, what most countries spend wow. on healthcare. And the current legislation um, sets the rate at about ten percent. Of course, we are going to you know have to do a study and, and find out more details, but it is setting the rate at much, much less than 18%. Yes, and so the, different, the difference under the legislation that, that you are sponsoring, yes. that Senator Eldridge is sponsoring, is that all of the private, all of the private money, mm -hmm. all the private spending that we're doing on health care, our premiums, employer premiums, mm -hmm. the copay deductibles, everything we've been talking about, it all goes away. The, the shift is to publicly funded health care. So yes, there, there are taxes involved. Yes. But those taxes are, are being set, at a, we think, at about 10 percent. And, and um, overall, almost everyone will pay less for their health care, mm -hmm. for far more comprehensive and continuous and secure coverage. Right. The way we have it now, it's connected with employment. If you lose your job, if your employer changes the, the policies, mm -hmm. if your family relationship changes so that you're not covered under a family policy anymore. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that can disrupt your coverage. And people are making life decisions based on health insurance. Exactly. Right now, which is kind of a crazy concept that you decide which job you're taking. I mean, I've certainly had friends who have been weighing two jobs and have gone with a you know, job that has better health insurance, even mm -hmm. though the other job maybe had more potential, or you put off having children, or you, you decide to get married because you're having children. And, and that makes it to, to make it more affordable to get that better coverage, but it doesn't feel like we should be making life decisions based on the whims of insurance companies. No, it, it, we certainly shouldn't, and I believe it should be simply a, you know, a, a, a right that we have to health care. And countries all over the world have that right. People feel secure that their health care needs will be met throughout their lifetime. So I don't want to misspeak, but how many countries in the world have this system? I don't know the number. Do you know the number? But it's not a small number, number, is it? Yeah. I feel like it's almost every other quote unquote developed nation. Oh, certainly. Yes. Okay. Among the sort of wealthy nations. Oh, yes. Right. So, so we're not talking and, about and many and authentic. many less wealthy countries yes. as well. As well. Yes. And have none adopted. Of them pay anything near the amount 
that the U.S. pays. And the vast majority have better health outcomes, particularly in areas such as maternal mortality and infant yes. mortality and chronic um, disease life expectancy. I was just going to ask about that because, of course, that's always the pushback. Well, we have such great care here. But I feel like the response to that is we have great care if you can afford it. Yeah. So I'm obviously going to be working really hard to pass this legislation. I think this is a, it's a heavy lift because we're talking about a big change in our mm -hmm. system and we're talking about a change in values as well. Um, so I'm happy to say that we just had the first Medicare for All caucus at the State House the other day, it's the first ever in the Commonwealth. Um, and as we were talking before we started filming, mm -hmm. you were mentioning about how Medicare for All or, or universe, single payer, universal health care, whatever we want to call it, originated in Canada. And I just thought it was fascinating because here in Massachusetts, we're trying to lead the way, right. hopefully for the nation, to fall into this sort of domino effect of everybody actually being able to afford and have coverage. And what happened in Canada? So in Canada, there was one province that um, established a universal health care mm -hmm. system, a Medicare system for all residents, it was Saskatchewan uh, mm -hmm. first. And uh, then at a time when many countries were developing national health systems, Canada also looked at this model from Saskatchewan and said, we effectively want this nationally. Um, it, it was working. Uh, yeah. And despite all the arguments, oh, Saskatchewan doesn't have a large population, oh, it's relatively homogenous, no yeah. major cities, not a lot of immigration. It, it was a wonderful model for the rest of the country. It didn't have to be exactly like the other right. settings for the model to be expanded. Well, and clearly, because all of the provinces are very different. Yes, and similarly, the way, I mean, Massachusetts was a leader um, and a model for a great deal of the Affordable Care Act. Right. And I think this is a fantastic opportunity, again, for Massachusetts to show leadership and and show other other states in the nation um, what healthcare could be. So on that note, let's talk about if people want to get involved, ways that they can do that. So we have the caucus at the State House now, and that is an, an inside, outside caucus. So we invite people who are organizers and activists, students, physicians to, to participate in that. And locally, we have a lot going on. So Deborah, would you like to speak to that? Sure, we do. And, and thank you for being part, not only part of that caucus, but a leader in that Absolutely. legislative caucus with Senator Eldridge and Senator Comerford. Yes. And Representative Tammy Gouveia. And Representative Gouveia. Um, it's wonderful. That's a great development. Um, here in Western Mass, we have, we're, we're, we have a wonderful um, group of people and organizations who have been working on Medicare for All. We have Western Mass Medicare for All, which is the organization I co-convene. Yes. And... Um, and, and we have groups in different cities and towns, including Northampton and including Amherst and East Hampton and Holyoke and South Hadley and a number of them. Um, and in Franklin County, we have Franklin County continuing the political revolution. Right. So we have lots of different um, organizations that we're working with, and we would love to have people join us. It's... it's um, it's, it's, it's as, as Lindsay was saying, it's not a simple fight. It's not a simple struggle. It's a very important one. Um, we need to build a very strong social movement yes. around this issue um, in order to, to see it pass. But we, but we are doing that, and we are seeing a lot of success, I think, and a lot of uh, momentum on this at the state level and at the national level, too. Um, and it's going to be very important in the elections coming up. Yes, it's, everybody's, it's, everybody's it's, talking about it. Everybody's talking. Right. It's at the top of the, you know, top of many people's minds right. is how are we going to have a sustainable, secure health care system in our state and in our country? So if someone wants to get involved with Western Mass Medicare for All, how do they do that? So we have a monthly meeting on the second Wednesday of the month. It's in Northampton. Uh, all the information is on our website, which yes. is www.wmmedicareforall.org. Great, oh, great. And there was just one last thing I wanted to mention because I don't know if I said before that you are also on the board of MassCare. Right. Which is, a, which is I think, the lead right now statewide organizing 
uh, group for Medicare for All in the state of Massachusetts. That's right. And I know we're working really hard to get a lot of activists connected to MassCare so that we can really organize across the state. So how do people get in touch with MassCare if they don't live in this part of the state and want to be involved? Absolutely. MassCare.org. Easy. <laughs> dum, 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 dum. <laughs> yes. MassCare.org. Excellent. And it would be wonderful to have folks from across the state. We're trying very hard to sort of uh, expand across the state yes. and build it out and the and working with the Legislative Caucus to see, to, to get that done. Yes. So we're very hopeful. Great. Thank you so much to both of you for being here. I really appreciate it, and I hope that this has um, been an informative way for people at home to really learn more about Medicare for All and to hopefully get involved in movement building. Excellent. Thank Thanks, Thank Lindsay. You.